wait. Well, you're going to learn about Jean-Marc Fulsac tonight. Chef, executive chef, Jean-Marc Fulsac. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for sticking. You're welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. With l'apéro and l'apéro clock every Thursday at five. Usually it's at five. Today it's at six. But we have a live event where we bring to you local uh, gastronomy leaders, people who are making a difference in the food industry and who live here in the Bay Area. So today we have executive chef Jean-Marc Fussac. Jean-Marc, if you don't mind, I'm going to give a quick introduction on who you are for the people who do not know who you are. Right. And then I'm going to go with questions. Is that okay with you, Jean-Marc? That's fine. So Jean-Marc, you've been trained uh, classical French uh, cuisine in a hotel and restaurant school in Strasbourg, France, at uh, l'école hôtelière. And then you came to the US where you work in uh, different prestigious restaurants in different parts of the country. You started in New York at the Lutes restaurant. Then you went to Compound Restaurant Santa Fe. Then you went to L'Hermitage Beverly Hills. You opened L'Olivier Restaurant in San Francisco. And then you worked for the Metropolitan Club uh, in San Francisco. So you were in the kitchen in all those different wonderful uh, five places. You were either a chef or executive chef. Yes. And then you took a turn uh, as far as trying to cook healthy food. Uh, I was a great teacher, Pierre. I, I first taught at the California Culinary Academy, which was the first uh, cooking school in California that pretty much launched the California cuisine movement. Got it. Yeah. So and you were a chef. I came. And at the, in that school, this is where I met Dr. Ornish. And I, I, when I first taught there, they did not have any healthy restaurant. I learned how to cook healthy food when I worked at the Metropolitan Club because it's a woman club and I work as a dietitian. And I then realized that you could apply this classical French technique and make food tasty. And then when I went to work at the California Clean Academy, which was founded by a member of the Metropolitan Club who had asked me to teach there. And, um, and then I said, you need to have a, co a healthy cooking classes. You don't have anything with nutrition. And I, I did a cooking class there and I opened a restaurant. This is where I met a healthy restaurant in the school. And this is where I met Dr. Ornish. And, um, and I worked with him for the past 12 years. And you know, it was first the research on heart disease. And when the research got published and he showed his results, the program just exploded. We co-wrote two cookbook bestseller in the New York Times. And then we start to have all this TV show nationwide. And we end up in a wine house and we train all the food service at the wine house. Air Force One, Ken David, the Navy mess. And I also trained the chef in the Navy, um, the Army and the Air Force. And just for you to know, you eat the wow. best in the Navy. Yes. The Navy is the best food. This is where you, we can wear our marinière. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then on top of that, you wrote many recipes. You wrote articles in different printed magazines like Vogue, the Wall Street Journal, the Sunset Magazine, and you did different appearances on TV shows. So you, you've done a lot. And then you went into the food service uh, part of the industry. You are the National Food Service Specialist yes. for Somerville Senior Living, as well as for the Emeritus Company. And finally, you have been the Executive Chef Instructor at the University of San Francisco since 1997. Yes. So I have a lot of questions for you. Could you tell us what is classical French cuisine? Because that's what you have on your resume. It says. Oh, yes. Okay. So classical French cuisine is, um, there is two main chefs. One is Carême and one is Escoffier. So Carême used to be the chef of the kings. And he's the chef then created the chef uniform. He created a talk. Uh, he also wrote all the technique into books, kind of like streamlined cookbooks. And he also, uh, he was kind of like a Renaissance man. So he was also into architecture and into pastry. 
And so to him, we owe the wedding cake. Oh. So it's Karen, who, who the wedding cake, and you see, it's from Karen, and also the profiterole, the pastry cream, the puff pastry, all the classic French desserts, Karen is behind. And then, but he was very, he only, he believed that food was for the noble, only for the nobility, that's it. And he would serve food in buffet, all the food at once. Then came Escoffier, and Escoffier kind of streamlined like everything. He formed brigades, a brigade system uh, to operate in, in a kitchen. And he also uh, developed a menu where you had appetizer, main course, etc. And he was the chef, the first chef to kind of like democratize food. So actually people could go to a hotel and have a, a, a meal there. And especially women who could actually go out to eat. They could out to the south, they could go to the Savoy Hotel and have a, a lunch or a dinner there. And, and this is why he had all his relations with this famous singer and opera singer. So he developed the Melba, the Pesh Melba or the Melba toast. And we had all the repertoire where you would cook, learn how to cook his food, right? Beef Wellington, um, Tourne de Rossini, all the classic food. So when I first started to cook, you could not deviate. You had to follow just like classical music. You had to memorize the recipe and follow exactly the recipe. Hmm. Then came Nouvelle Cuisine, which kind of like liberated the chef, where you could be more creative, a little bit like jazz to classical music. Then came Regional Cuisine. Then came Farm to Table uh, Cuisine. And now we have the latest values like you know, Molecular and Fusion Cuisine. Well, it's very interesting. I had no idea about all of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So thank you for explaining now. You, you asked me, so yes, you know. <laughs> hey, if we can all learn one thing per day, that's great. Here you go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, you know, you, you trained in Strasbourg, you know. Uh, uh, could you tell us a bit more about this place where people, some people may have not gone to Strasbourg and what kind of food? Strasbourg is famous for what? What kind of gastronomy we have in this part of France? So Strasbourg is, uh, you know, it, it's a, it's a province that's between Germany and France. So we have lots of German influence, but they also have very good restaurants, uh, l'Auberge de Lille, or the classic. They're very famous for foie gras, for choucroute, sauerkraut. It's a very rich food. Uh, they have very good restaurants. Uh, last year, the best restaurant in the world was the Crocodile in Strasbourg, in Trip Advisor. So they have a very fine tradition of, of, of fine dining there. Uh, and a lot of famous chefs came out of uh, Auberge de Lille and Alsace. Yeah. And something that I think is quite interesting, because, I mean, you are working at the University of San Francisco for quite some time now. 20 years. Uh, yeah. And could you tell us a bit more about uh, the president of USF? and his relationship to Strasbourg? Well, yeah, the president, our president, uh, Father Paul Fitzgerald, was, uh, was actually, he studied cooking in Strasbourg. So he went to Ecole Hôtelier de Strasbourg, and he actually cooked at Buffet de la Gare in Strasbourg, uh, oh. which was very funny. And when we were, I was talking to him, and the reason why I started to cook was we used to have um, you know, the famous train, like the Orient Express, this beautiful train, they would go from London into um, Constantinople. Uh, and this beautiful train had a fine restaurant wagon. And in the, in the wagon, you would see white tablecloths, you would see the chef in the back with the talk. And, and he remembered this very well. And that actually what inspired me to cook because it's like, oh, I want to go in there and travel. And uh, so he was telling me a story where when he worked at a train station, they would go out with a cart and bring food and, and give food to the passenger through the window, sell food wow. to the window like this to the passenger. So, so is this how you, is that, is that how your, your love of hospitality, your love of gastronomy comes from? Where, where, where did you start to have that passion for? for cooking and traveling and... Uh... No, because, because when I was a kid, I used to, I used to play in the playground and there was this, this train would pass by, right? The Orient Express, the Zephyr, all those fancy old train. 
And I was always fascinating when I saw the restaurant and in the back of the restaurant, you would see the chef with the talk, with the white talk. And I was thinking like, God, what a, what a great lifestyle. Tonight is gonna, maybe it's gonna be in London tomorrow, or it's gonna be in Constantinople. What an incredible, um, exciting job this must be. And then I decided to become a chef and I've been traveling since. So, so you wanted to travel, but did you have a dream to come to the US? Was it really a destination you had in mind? It was kind of an accident. I ended up in New York. And um, in New York, I was very lucky to, to meet André Solner, who was, which was the chef at Lutez at the time. And Lutez at the time was in a 16 top restaurant in the world. And I had a chance to work there. So it was a great opportunity. And it was very exciting to work there. I mean, Jacqueline Kennedy and, and Richard Nixon would come and eat during the same evening. This is the time where Democrats and Republicans used to eat together. So, so it was very exciting and I learned a lot. And he is one of my you know, true master chefs. He was the mayor of Riet France, you know, when you have the, the red, red and blue, uh, like Paul Bocuse or yeah. So, so you, how was the energy in New York comparing to the energy you can have in San Francisco or in New Mexico? How so was those it? are two very different energies. So New York, because it's closer to Europe, New York is very technical. It's very where you take food and you apply really complex technique. Um, it's very professional. In order to survive in New York, you have to be on top of your game. And, and San Francisco, it's more like jazzy. It's more like, you know, you go with the flow, you go with the farm, you get some nice ingredients. It's a bit more like, like jazz. So, uh, but New York is much more structural. They're both very good, fantastic city to work. And I would highly recommend to people to work in New York a little bit in your life. How many years did you work in New York for, Jean-Marc? Three years, three years. And then you moved, that's when you moved to New Mexico. Yeah, because, you know, I, when I first apprenticed, I apprenticed in a hunting lodge in, 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 the, in the forest, and I missed nature. I mean, plus New York in the 70s was a tough city, right? It's like during Taxi Driver, there was a lot of... Uh, it was not. It was not the glitzy New York now that that is now. So I, after three years, I got a little bit tired. So I said, I'm going to go explore the country. Went to New Mexico for two years, which was fantastic. But over there, I realized I could not learn much anymore. I, I reached the top, and it's like I, I need to go to California to work on with some more you know, good chefs. So I went to the Hermitage Hotel in in Beverly Hill, and I worked with some another you know, three Michelin star chef there. And, so L'Hermitage Le, Le, was already a three stars Michelin at the time, Jean-Marc? It, it, it didn't have the Michelin system, but it was like a five star hotel. It was like the best hotel at the time in LA. All mm -hmm. the movie stars used to live there. And it was very exclusive, only 40 dinner a night. Uh, very, very exclusive to stay there, but fantastic place, yeah. So how many stars have you seen? How many people? Have you seen, you know, those famous... Oh, quite a bit, yeah, quite a bit, yeah. I mean, <laughs> in my career, yeah, I mean, like, uh, some very interesting one, like, you know, Salvatore Dali, I used to cook for, and he took a really sugary carp that with his moustache, he gave it to me, and uh, Steve Jobs, I cooked for him, that was interesting, and a lot, yeah. And at the time, you could not take pictures like we do now. Otherwise, you will probably have like three or four hundred selfies pictures. You know, I, I have I have some pictures with them because you know they were they were so exciting. So I have some yeah, it's some exciting picture. And and I went to the White House with Clinton too, and I in the White House in the Oval Office, and he re, he received me to tell mm -hmm. me. Could you tell us about a bit more about the White House when you were the guest chef at the White House? How I, I mean, first of all, how do you get invited? Do you get a... Well, I do it because, uh, you know, I've worked with this doctor, Dean Ornish, and, um, and Bill Clinton had some health problems, health issues, and he wanted to improve his diet. So we went there on three occasions in the White House, and we trained all their food service, the White House, Camp David, the Navy Mess, and Air Force One, basically. So, and, so there is a kitchen in the White House. The kitchen in the White House was actually made a, a national monument by Jacqueline Kennedy, which I used to cook for in New York. And then, so it's still the same kitchen, all the same stainless steel, the same equipment. It's like a time, uh, time, time zone there. And it's fascinating. Wow, 
Did you yeah. so so did you meet as well uh, uh, President Clinton? Did you get a chance to? Yeah, yeah I, I met him and I, I met him and he thanked me uh, in, in the Oval Office and he was a, a very charismatic, charming man. And we, we did a big we, we, we did a big dinner for him. One time he he asked us, yeah, Dr. Onish, that oh we want to have a big dinner with Hillary and Chelsea and I. We want to try. 30 dishes, uh, bring three chefs. So it's like, okay, so he told me, okay, which chef are you going to bring? So we bought Michael Lomonaco from New York. At that time, he was the chef of Window of the World, the two towers. And we bring Uber Keller from Fleur de Lis. And we went there together. So we had East Coast, West Coast. And the three of us went there. And each of us had 10 dishes in the period of one hour, which was very funny because... Um, so we, every two minutes, we had a new dish. And I was coordinating the chef, right? And I could see they were, well, first I explained to them the diet, what was required in a diet, and to make sure that we don't repeat the same dishes. And then I said, oh, um, you know, those guys have big team. Just me, I'm just cooking myself. At first we fly the food to the wine house. And I said, I, I cannot compete with this guy. I'm going to make some simple thing. And I remember Bill Clinton used to jog in McDonald's in Arkansas. And I said, well, he likes his hamburger. So maybe I'm going to bring him a soy burger. So I bought a soy burger. It was called a Boca burger. And I made an organic buns. I made some ketchup with low sugar, baked some fries. And I bought my food there. And then when we unpacked the food, Michael Le Monaco from New York, who is Italian, and he's very temperamental. Like, you know, the real New York intense is like, what, Jama? What the F is this? You, you're bringing an F burger here. I'm cooking a dinner at the White House and you're going to serve an F burger? Are you kidding? <laughs> and it's like, Michael, Michael, just relax. It's not a regular burger. It's actually a soy <laughs> burger. It's good for you when it's organic bonds. And, um, and then the dinner started. And because we had 30 courses, every two minutes, there would be a next plate where they were sharing one plate. Uh, Bill Clinton, um, Hillary, and Chelsea were saying, so we, the plate went up and up, and then it's, the burger went up, and everybody looked at me, the burger went up, and things stopped. And it was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, <laughs> is wrong. Everybody looked at me, Michael looked at me, and at the end they said, now they want to have three more. They want to have one for everybody. And it turned out to be his favorite dish. And then the New York yeah. Times picked on it, the New York Times picked the story, Wrote down, chef served Boca Burger at the White House. And then we had all the food service were selling Boca Burger, the Navy Mess, Air Force One. And, and Boca Burger be became a very big thing. And Kraft Food bought this company and uh, put it on the market. So it became a very big deal, which is kind of funny because now the latest burger, where you have impossible meat, mm -hmm. those new vegetable burgers coming out, uh, which had they have quite improved since then, but I'm, I'm like, oh yeah, I've done this like 20 years ago. I know this burger. <laughs> wow, that's a, that's a good one. That's a good yeah. story. I like that story. Yeah. Wow, wow. Jean-Marc. Yeah. yeah. So, and I, I use this in my lesson when I teach my classes at USF. So when, you, when you're a chef, you don't cook for yourself. You cook for your, the people you cook for. You're here to please people. So that when you design food or a restaurant, you don't, unless you're a super chef, people come for your food, but you cook for your customers and whatever they like, yes. So, so w w why did you have that interest very early on on a healthy, on a healthy food? What, w because, I mean, you were a visionaire because now it's obviously a very big thing for the what last what is, Okay, I used to work at the Metropolitan Club, which is the largest women club in the West Coast. And when I worked there, um, you had, I did, being a woman club, you have lots of women dining and they have health issues and they like to eat healthy. So I work with a nutritionist and we are doing some healthy thing on the menu for, our, for the member of the club. And then I realized, I said, wait, I can apply classical uh, technique, right? We go back to classical cooking, classical technique, apply this technique into food and make them pretty tasty actually. So it actually is not bad. And I, I, I was it's kind of interesting to tweaking around this. And so then I went to the California Culinary Academy, the school, and I told them, hey, you guys need to have a, you need to teach nutrition in your, uh, in your school. 
because that's what they, we teach in France. You always learn nutrition is part of your three years training. I said, you have the nutrition classes. You guys should have one. They said, well, we don't know how to do it. It's like, well, I know how to do it. So I said, well, you do it. And then we open a restaurant. This restaurant become quite a buzz. And this Dr. Ornish heard about that. Dean Ornish, which was like, he was starting this, this research on heart disease. And he came to see me. He's like, hey, can you cook me a vegetarian food with no fat? And I said, yeah, sure. Come for lunch. I'll make you something. So I made him a food. And he's like, you know what? I love it. You need to work for me. And I said, listen. I am French. I eat steak. I smoke cigarette, which is which was terrible back then. I smoke cigarette and steak. I'm not your guy. <laughs> and he was persistent and persistent. He said, he said, listen, I went through eight chefs in one year. Uh, they're all like microbiotic chef, vegan chef, vegetarian chef. I went through eight chefs in one year. Nobody can cook like you. You need to come. Even my patient are going to die. Because he was doing <laughs> research. I said, okay, fine. I'm going to take a year off. And then work with you and you know try to see how it and set you up, set your immune system up. And, and then when I work, it was in a research table, but I could actually see the patients who were improving, their health were improving before in a period of one or two months, you could see people, they could work better, they feel better. And it's like that is fascinating, the power of food, uh, how, what food can do to you. And then um, and then his, his research got published in the Lancet magazine, which is a medical magazine, and it exploded. Right? Then you can actually stop or reverse heart disease through diet and lifestyle changes. And, and then is where we went to all the TV and we went to the wine house and we co-wrote some books. And, and interestingly, the first book we did with him, right? So we, called, we contacted all those big chefs, Uber Keller, uh, Bin Wan in San Francisco, Alice Water, all those big chefs in New York, Wolfgang Pock, and we say, hey guys, can you make a recipe for us? And they all made a recipe for the first book. And the idea was to um, introduce vegetarian food to uh, upscale dining, right? So all the chef played, they played around with it. And then Uber Keller at Flodis was the first you know, high-end restaurant to offer a vegetarian menu alternative in his menu. So it was very great. It was cool. It was very cool. I did it for 12 years, work with Dr. Nish for 12 years. Wow, really so you were, you were really a, a precursor. You were really a... And, and I was, I, it was interestingly, I was vegetarian for, uh, for probably like eight years. I changed my diet because I realized that if I stop eating meat and I eat what I cook, then you, you understand the craving. And I became a much better vegetarian chef in the process as well. And I still enjoy vegetarian food to those days, but yeah. So, so and you do teach this at the School of Nursery so at USA? In, in, yeah, we have a healthy cooking class. So we, we have several classes. There is a component. We, especially the last, the last year, I told all my students, I told the university, when you could see all those um, crazy fire in France, right? If you remember how the heat wave and all those things. And I said, you know, we need to look at food differently. We need to food, look at food differently, food that is good for the environment, right? And you know, then, especially with this animal factory farm, they create so much pollution. It, the product are horrible, they're horrible for your health. It makes people sick, it makes the environment sick. So I said, we're gonna, we're gonna switch to a very big component in our diet, it's gonna be plant-based. So, so we have plant-based diet. We still have some, we use a minimum amount of, uh, of meat that's animal meat uh, that is humanly raised, but the big focus is on uh, vegetarian and plant based. So we're switching into this. And then I also teach a class with the School of Nursing student, and there we do a lot of vegetarian cooking as well. So you have the School of Nursing at USF, University of San Francisco, yes. and then you have the Hospitality Management Program as yes. well. Yeah, and I also teach with the English as a second language, the ESL classes. And we have Chinese students who come, or foreign students, who learn how to speak English through cooking. Oh. And if you want to hear a funny story, Pierre, we had one time, we, uh, we had the Chinese TB who came, because we have a lot of Chinese students, and we were cooking uh, Thanksgiving. So we were cooking Thanksgiving, you know, the whole turkey, yeah. the, the, the pie, the pecan pie, the whole thing. And then they were filming, and the students were filming and streaming into China. 
And I was thinking, you know, only in San Francisco, you're going to have a French guy cooking Thanksgiving to Chinese people. <laughs> 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 Yeah. That's very true, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's why we love this city. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it's a melting pot, right? In some yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. If you have the talent for cooking, you have it. It yeah. doesn't matter yeah. what it is or to whom. Yeah. And you know, it's funny because the first time you and I we were in touch, and when I learned about the hospitality management program, and that you were a chef, I was like, a chef, but First of all, who did you te teach to? So, I mean, now we, but wh where do you cook? Well, needless to say, I was amazed by the kitchen. Yeah, we have, we, had a, we, we had a great kitchen. So, interestingly, when I first started to cook, Pierre, I cooked with coal. Okay. With coal, coal yeah. and wood burning, right? Which I know some people think coal should come back. I tell you, it's very hot, it's smoky, it's <laughs> dirty. You don't want to cook with coal. And now I cook with induction and digitalized computerized oven. So we went a long way, yes. And you have a beautiful kitchen. Yes. Your students are sitting in front of you on tables or standing up, and you have some kind of mirror on yeah. top. We have a demo kitchen, kitchen. yes. Yeah. Now, we, it's not a cooking school, right? It's before management. Yes. But hotel management. But in order to understand how a hotel works, you have to understand how a kitchen works. And, and I must say, this new generation of students who live in this digital world, right? they are so detached from, from reality. They are all in this digital world. They love to cook. They love to cook because food is real. Food is organic. And, and they love to cook. So they, 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 those classes are very popular. The students love to cook. So do they learn only on how to cook or do they learn on how to do events? What do you so, do? That's right. So, they, so we, we had learn how to cook, learn how to serve. Uh, we have the back of the house, front of the house. And then we do big events like we did for you, Pierre, for L'Apero, where we break down the class in teams. One team is in the back of the house and we structure it with the brigade system, just like Escoffier. We have an executive chef, sous chef, pastry chef, appetizer chef, sauce chef. And then we produce those events, those very high end events that are fundraising for the university. And I must say, I taught in some other school, like the CCA, I worked at some other community uh, chef school. Uh, our students are amazing. They, they do beautiful stuff. Yeah. So, how many of those events do you do per year, roughly? Four. You know? so, uh, three to four. Three to four. Three to four, yes. And then we have one with L'Apero, and we love, we love your L'Apero crowd. I mean, it just... Well, well, we love it. And I tell you, I mean, you know, it's amazing to see 20, how many, 20, 25 students being yes. involved from the back of the house, cooking, uh, serving the food, welcoming people, uh, doing the raffle ticket. I mean, it's, it's a whole production. And for a lot of them, it's their first time doing this, right? I mean... Yes. And yeah, they're doing so well. I mean, I was always amazed. We, we've been doing that twice now, two or three times. Yeah. Is that our third time uh, or second time? Uh, three times, three times. Time. We did Federal Gastronomy and then we did two, uh, yes, yes. by the time. Well, dinner. your students are fantastic. I mean, it's it's hard to believe that most of them have never done that before. I yes. mean, they put their heart on it. They yes. really have fun. Yeah. So some of them do work in hotels mm -hmm. and, and, and they have a passion for uh, hotel, restaurants, and yeah. So what do you think, what what advice, alors, let me come back. For a student who wants to work in the hospitality or the gastronomy world, what do you think are the main qualities that person should have in order to be successful and to enjoy a career in gastronomy or in hospitality? What are the main qualities for a person to do that? Oh, you have to love what you're doing. You have to love what you're doing. And I always say, you know, be, before you join one of those expensive cooking schools, and but people ask me, you should actually work first, do an uh, internship. And, and our program actually have an internship program where we tell students, we send students into the industry and, and to learn. So you have to see, it's not made for everybody, but, um, 
you know, I've been doing it all my whole life, and I know a lot of students who just love this this industry. And uh, let me ask you a bit more questions about uh, students. So, in your class, in the hospitality man management class, there is limited students, right? Is twenty? How many students do you have per? Yeah, we try to have twenty students uh, in a classroom, not more, because then it gets too diluted. So it's a, it's a smaller classroom, intimate classroom, yes. So do they do, do they have to go through different testing in order to join your program, or how does it work? No, no. Well, the program. Remember, we have the student for three years, right? So first, mm -hmm. they learn all the theory, the mm -hmm. theory classes through demonstration and all the theories, and then and then they learn the hands-on classes where they practice a little bit on hands-on, and then they apply all what they have learned to the theory and the hands-on classes on producing those events. So they, mm -hmm. it's like you know, applying the science. So it's a three, it's a three yeah. years, three years, process. three years, yes, yeah. And then our student graduate with in, with the school of business, they actually have a business degree with an emphasis on on hotel and restaurant management. Uh, you've been at USF for twenty three years. Yes. What changes did you see within USF, and how have you involved in those twenty three years at USF at University of San Francisco? Well, you know, I love teaching at USF. I just like, because our students are so, we have a great student from all over different country, different social backgrounds. It's a very interesting group of students. Um, and this is why I love to teach there so much. Uh, what I've seen is the last, maybe the last five or six years when students became into like this digital, you know, hmm. uh, checking in thumbs up all this this culture or uh, <laughs> yeah uh, they it, it they kind of like lost their attention which was kind of i had to change my way of teaching i had to change my way of teaching because they were so distracted and you cannot multitask and learning one thing right and especially when it comes to food food doesn't lie you have to be very present so I had to be very strict with them. I had to just no phone, get your phone off, that's it. And almost like a detox. It's like a yeah. detox. <laughs> Remove their phone and, and be very strict with them. And I also learned that their attention span has diminished because I guess they are so used to see YouTube videos mm -hmm. like this. Uh, they don't like to read too much for a long time. So I, I got rid of the textbook now and I just do a, And then you do more, you, you involve multimedia and you have to be much more attention and, and really uh, work them hard to get their attention. Yeah. So you're trying to make your student more healthy, healthy again. You're talking about well, healthy food. Yeah, <laughs> especially now, you know, USF bought a farm. They yes. bought a farm. They bought the oldest organic farm in Northern California. And, uh, and lots of people are like, why, why a farm? Why, why an organic farm? Well, it's very important. We, we teach sustainability in our program, it's part of our program. And it's very important, even though we, we cannot serve organic 100%, but some organic is very important just to, prever, to preserve the biodiversity, right? I mean, we use so much chemical when we farm, then we destroy all those insects. There is so many, I don't know how many species uh, got extended this uh, last year. Uh, so it's very important to preserve biodiversity, right? Just imagine a world without bees, it would yeah. be terrible. So this, and it's a beautiful farm, you have gorgeous vegetables, and we are very lucky in North California, people are really into this, right? They love, they love, uh, especially with Alice Water, who bought the farm to table movement. Uh, people love high quality food and things like this. So, so we apply this with our, with our teaching and we bring food from the farm and, Teach, teach the student the value of, um, of nature and, and earth and, and how important it is. Those are very important values. And I think we're we at a point of our life right now, right, where we have, we, we, technology is like taking over very much so. And we're in the process of using our, losing our humanity, right? And, and it's very important to not lose this humanity. We have to be very careful not to be completely into this technology and be controlled and dominated and then just like kill nature because they would be terrible. Right? And so, so we try to, 
to use this. So talking about technology, how did you do with the COVID-19 and the university? So yes, so now I'm, I'm, I, so I had to switch my class on Zoom, which is like a yeah. completely different way of cooking. Um, I require some students now to cook at home and we cook together at Zoom. And, um, and it's, uh, it's also very, uh, very different and difficult too, because you know, you're competing against YouTube video. Uh, they are like very polished and you are live right, with, in Zoom in the kitchen. Um, so you kind of like have to flip the script on the student and make them, make them, get them involved in the process. I work, they work in team and you just change your way of teaching to, to for them to learn, yeah. Because, uh, I mean, you lost two months or three months of teaching. How many months did you... Yeah, yeah, March, yeah, three months about that. Yeah. So I did, I finished the semester online. And actually, interestingly, some students enjoyed it, right? Yeah. Because they could actually, the one who could cook, they could actually cook at home. Oh, yeah. And the, yeah, so they could cook at home and then they realized they were able to cook those dishes in their own kitchen. I was like, wow, I cannot believe it. I can actually make this in my own <laughs> kitchen. And then, and then the best part was like the parents, the parents of the of the, the student is like, oh, the mother would have really loved it. My parents are watching it. They were learning how to cook. <laughs> now I'm, I'm teaching the student and the parents. There <laughs> you go. <laughs> Technology. Technology for you, yes. Hey, Jean-Marc, technology yeah. was not good on us today. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, today was tough. Today was very rough. Yeah, it was um, it was a tough start. Yeah. Oh my god. It, it happens, you know, it's like um, Yes. It is very okay. Uh, let me ask you uh, some, I would say, funny questions. What are your favorites in the city or in the Bay Area? If you had to pick one restaurant. Oh, no, don't go with one. Don't go with one. I, I have many. No, no. People ask me this all the time. I say, Look, it's like if you have many children, what is your favorite? Children? No, 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 no. Okay. Well, let me let let me rephrase it. Uh, okay, which part of the Bay Area do you think has has the most uh, most good restaurant? Is it San Francisco? Is it Napa? Is it Sonoma? Is it the but city? The it's, it's all over the Bay Area, Pierre. I mean, yeah. God, if you go to Yonville, look at the, all the fantastic restaurants Yonville you have, right alone in Napa. And San Francisco has amazing restaurant. There is more Michelin star restaurant yeah. in the Bay Area than New York. Yeah. I mean, let me tell you, it's like- We're number yeah. one. Do you, have a, do you have a favorite food, favorite kind of food, uh, Chinese? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, like, I like Chinese. I love dim sum. I like Chinese. So I like uh, palette um, in San Francisco. I like uh, the peony, peony in, in Oakland for, for yeah. dim sum. I love dim sum. I just love dim sum. I love Chinese food. I like Indian food, mm -hmm. uh, August 15. Um, okay. I like Japanese food, and the, the Iazara in 4th Street on Berkeley. Uh, you know. Well, I, I, which is which is the beauty of San Francisco, right? We can travel yes. all around the world and try every kind of different kind of food being here, which is nice. Yes. Yeah. And they also have, you know, fantastic French restaurant here too. I mean, 165 and La Folie, then all those restaurants, they were amazing, yes. Which kind of drink do you like to drink, uh, Chef? Are you more wine? Are you more... Uh... No, I mean, my favorite thing is champagne. 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 That's my favorite, yeah. I could have a whole dinner with champagne. And then, you know, I, have, I you go into phases. I like gin and tonic right now. Um, little cocktail. And I also like red wine. I'm more like a red wine. And I like deep red wine, like deep, rich Bordeaux, very earthy. And, yeah. What do you do? I'm pretty sure you do apéro at home once a while. So apéro, it's a happy hour with yeah. some smiggle, small finger foods. What is your perfect apéro? What do you put when you have someone coming in or when you, when you want to enjoy an apéro? What do you have on the table for an apéro? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, it depends who's coming. It, it depends who's coming, right? Oh, yes. I mean, uh, so I have when my, when I have my Asian friends, I actually cook some Chinese ribs and things like this because they like this. And then you have the French people. Then we have, you know, uh, 
Cornichon. The saucisson and then the cheese. I, I love great cheese. I love cheese and wine together. Yeah. Good. Do you put some pâté or some cacahuète? Yes. Yes, of <laughs> course. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what is a do you do you eat do you go to food trucks chef have you tried food trucks and uh yes some yes uh what yeah. did you think of it were you impressed by any of the my, my, my favorite or? food truck was actually in santa cruz there's this little food truck that has in a restaurant there that is right by the beach and they do the best fish tacos. The best fish tacos are amazing. It's worth to drive down there, yeah. What's your favorite food to cook at home? If you're at home and you like to cook something for you, what Again, would you do? Like it, it really, I, I go with the season, right? I go with okay. the season, yeah. Right now, artichoke are great, uh, yeah. And I have to tell you something, camembert with butter and bread, that counts as cooking. <laughs> That's my favorite. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can cook. <laughs> uh, one more question. Uh, you know, we're talking about hospitality, we're talking about hotels. What is the best hotel you went to where the ser service was amazing or the location was amazing? Uh, could you share with us if you had to choose one hotel uh, oh, in New Mexico oh. or anywhere you went? That oh, really that's like a good one. Oh, that's a good one. I used to like the Ritz in Health Moon Bay when Chef Xavier was there. And I went oh, yeah. to see him in Cabos uh, yeah. when, when he worked there. And that was amazing experience. Um, I, I like the, I actually like the, the Fairmont um, Mission Sonoma Inn. I love their spa there, and they had Santé, they had a good restaurant there. Yeah. And, okay. and my favorite hotel are actually in, in Asia. Asia has beautiful hotel. Right? If you go to Thailand, they have, they have gorgeous hotels there. And they really know how to do uh, ho hospitality there. Maybe, maybe the cost of the labor has to yeah. see with the, maybe the level of service you can receive as well. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. The, the, the labor, but also just their way of doing it. They have such a, a gracious sense and they're just so happy to see you. There is something that really is a nice experience. Right. Yeah. Japan too have, are very good too. Japan hotel are very good too. Chef, I think I'm, uh, I think we you know I had uh, some questions to ask you. I think I'm done with those questions. Is there anything you want to share with people watching us? Is there anything you would like to let people know or some kind of last? You know? Yeah, there is something. So I, I, when I finished my class, uh, I, um, this semester when we had this COVID crisis, uh, I told my students, I said, you know, a crisis in Chinese, it's written with two characters. The first character is danger. The other character is opportunity. And, and I said, well, when we go to a crisis, we have to now look and make sure we take the right opportunity yeah. in the future, in the way we approach food with the environment. And also then we can you know, keep our humanity. And I said, this is the opportunity to take after this crisis. In order to survive this crisis, we're gonna to have to have generosity, compassion in the whole world in order to survive that. So that was my, my, my word. And then I, I, I'm going to finish also with um, what I said in the gastronomy uh, event, remember? Yeah. And I said that gastronomy is like art. Gastronomy like art is a bridge across culture. And San Francisco, the shiny city by the bay, is the most beautiful bridge in the world, is the best place to celebrate gastronomy. And I hope we can do this again with La Perro as soon as possible. We will. Okay. Chef, we will. Good. <laughs> Jean, Chef Jean-Marc Pulsac, thank you very much for your time and your patience today. It was quite difficult to get things started, but I always uh, appreciate you for who you are because you're very optimistic. You're always willing to do things, new things. Your career path is pretty unusual and pretty fantastic. 
you touch uh, different side of the industries. You know, usually people stay comfortable with one and they do the, the same things the whole time. Where well, you changed, uh, you know, past staying in what you know and how to do. But I really hope that people, uh, you know, will uh, get some great information from what we talked about. If anyone has any question, wants to reach out to Chef, please, you can put some comments. I will be very happy to answer and connect you with uh, Chef Misak. And, uh, well, listen, I want to say uh, Santé. Uh, it's L'Apero time. It's 6.42. Hey, Bagas is downstairs in the other room where I didn't work. <laughs> I'll get it back. But uh, thank you very much. Chef. I see you very soon. Okay. Uh, be well. And you as Chef say, it's half full or half empty. Let's look at the half uh, full side, right? It's all right. Sounds good, Pierre. Nice ah. to see you again. And Merci, chef. hello to all your fans. Thank you. Au revoir. Au revoir. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.